Hey guys, so today's the day, finally. It's our first Homeschool Mom book club discussion and we are talking about The Call of the Wild and Free by Ainsley Ermend. Let's dive in. If you're new here, my name's Erin. I'm a homeschooling mom to four kids, and we just wrapped up our seventh year of homeschooling, and I thought it would be really fun to do a book club here on my YouTube channel. And so I posted here on the community tab some suggestions of different books and had you guys vote on what your top choices were, would be. And the one that got the most votes was this one. And so this was what we just read for the month of June, and we are gonna dive in and talk all about it today. Now I chose this book as one of the options because I've read it before and it personally finding the Wild and Free organization about three or four years ago has transformed completely how we homeschool and I knew that this would be one that would be really impactful to many people out there. It is a book that I would highly recommend to any, especially new homeschooler, but really anyone who's feeling discouraged or frustrated with how their homeschooling is going, this is a great place to start. So before we dive in real quick, let's do some little housekeeping items. Let's talk about how this is going to work. So I'm going to go through and talk about some of my highlights from this book. There's certainly not enough time to cover everything that is important and valuable that's in this. So as I go through this, I will have some discussion questions kind of peppered in throughout my talking. Those will be times for you to drop your own personal comments and thoughts in the comment section below. So when those come up, what I'm going to do, because I'm going to be watching this live with you, is I'm going to post my own comment with that question in it. And then it will kind of help us keep the comments a little bit more organized if you can then reply to that question when I post it instead of just having a bunch of random comments on there. I think it'll help us to keep all of those similar thoughts kind of focused together. Um, but obviously feel free to add any other insights that you gleaned from the different sections as we go through them or things that were really impactful to you. Um, I'd love to hear what those are and I'm sure other moms will too. Also, I have made quite a few videos over the last two years about a lot of the subjects that she talks about in this book too. So I'm gonna mention when there is something that I've done that kind of applies to the topic that we're talking about. And then I will have links to all of those videos in the description below so that if you want a little bit more of kind of my personal take on those things, you can go watch those videos later. All right, so let's dive in to The Call of the Wild and Free. She has this book kind of split into four different kind of categories. So the first section is the mission of homeschooling. And I have my notes here, so I'm going to be glancing down periodically. But she's kind of talking about the why to homeschool and how important it is to find your own personal why. She talks about how there are statistics showing how kids are so much more stressed now than they've ever been before. How kids are kind of forced to grow up earlier and earlier and when they're deprived of that childhood and that time for play and creativity and wonder it really creates this atmosphere of more anxiety and stress for them and so a big part of the why of doing this is kind of reclaiming that childhood that time of freedom and exploration for our kids so that they can have a stronger foundation as they move forward in their life she said on page 15 that there is nothing more natural to a mother's heart than to look after the needs of her own children, to preserve their childhoods, and to give them the chance to be who they were made to be. We need only to keep the voices from convincing us otherwise. And that I know can be a struggle. There are so many outside voices telling us that this isn't the way to go, that we're gonna mess them up if we homeschool, that um, they're not gonna learn all the things that they need to learn and all of those things. And we need to learn to just silence those voices and trust our instinct and trust the process of homeschooling because it 
is worth it. We have to just be careful to filter those outside voices and rely on what we know to be true and the reason why we're choosing to homeschool. So I'm really curious. Here's the first discussion question. What drew you to homeschooling? Why'd you decide to do this? In chapter three, the call to homeschooling, she kind of goes through a lot of the pros of homeschooling and why she decided to homeschool and why a lot of other people decide to homeschool as well. And I recently just did a video about the pros of homeschooling that tie into a lot of these things. Um, but I mentioned some other things in there too. So if you're curious about that, make sure you check that one out later. I love her quote on page 27. She said, when you remove the stumbling blocks to education, you're left with the pull of passion. Each day becomes an opportunity to explore one's interests and curiosities. Imagine education being driven by passion instead of pressure. That's so good. And isn't that what it's about? It's about helping our kids to find what they're passionate about and allowing the freedom to pursue those things as part of their education, not as something that is being done on top of their education or instead of it, that we can incorporate those things into the homeschool process. I know that many of you are first time homeschoolers or just planning to start up this fall and this kind of can describe a lot of us out there. Chapter four, preparing for the journey. She kind of talks about like, this is how to start homeschooling, all the things you need to think about from um, legal implications, as well as choosing curriculum and figuring out your own routine and finding your tribe and all of those kind of things, which are all important to make sure that you're gonna set yourself up for success. And I have a video about how to start homeschooling as well that I'll link below. In chapter five, Becoming Wild and Free, she kind of talked about the process of how the Wild and Free organization started and um, how it really has grown over the years. And she has a quote on page 59 that I really liked. She said, dear friend, don't let a bustling culture determine the needs of your own children. You get to choose how they grow up you can protect their time, energy, and imagination. You are the gatekeeper of the garden of their childhood. And I just love that, that we don't have to feel this outside pressure from other people to kind of follow the traditional norm, right? We have the choice to give our children a different option. We get to homeschool them and allow them to be kids, to explore their own interests, to have freedom to pursue what ignites their passion. And we really, we just don't have to listen to what the culture says. We can choose to be different and different is beautiful. Moving on to the myths section. She kind of has, um, in chapter six, she talks about different objections to homeschooling. Um, Number one was, I can't do this, I'm not qualified, I don't have the time, I can't afford it, my spouse is not on board, and I can't do this alone. So these are some of the common things that people, kind of hang-ups that people have when they're first thinking about homeschooling. So discussion question two, which one of these are you still struggling with now? Chapters seven through 11, she spends a good deal of time covering these different myths about homeschooling and why they're actually myths. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about all of these because I feel like she covered them. I do have a video about some of the myths too that you can watch later, but she talked about socialization, qualification, learning, rigor, and college and different myths regarding those and different ideas and questions and concerns that a lot of people have when they're thinking about homeschooling or just from outsiders, these are the things that they're like, well, but what about this? And how are they gonna do that? And all of those things that can raise those questions in our own mind and make us start doubting how homeschooling is gonna work for our family and those kind of things. On the whole learning myth subject, I love how she kind of put this on page 107, and I'm just gonna read it. It's a little bit of a long quote, but I feel like it's so good. She said, homeschooling is controversial because it raises the question of how children learn, and it's an important one. All parents want their kids to receive a quality education. So is home the best place for learning? The conventional educational model insists that learning happens in groups, 
with one standardized system for everybody. Because of classroom restraints, there's a lack of individual attention. Each child is taught the same information and tested on the basis of their ability to retain and comprehend the data. Any failure to comply ends with the child being demoralized with a poor GPA at best and labeled as having a learning disability at the worst. The homeschooling model says that children learn differently and thrive in an environment where they can go at their own pace, pursue subjects that interest them and have the time and space to explore the wonder of childhood. It asserts that learning is a natural process for children and if we only guide and encourage them, they can fully become who they were meant to be. This might sound like a revolutionary concept, but children were educated this way until school got swept into the industrial revolution and learning was relegated to the assembly line with the likes of automobiles, railroad ties, and machine parts. Kids became viewed as products to manufacture rather than individuals to nurture, cultivate, and grow. And I feel like that kind of sums up a lot of kind of the differences between public school education and homeschooling. To me, like, there's no question which one is better for the child. And um, I think with homeschooling, the child comes first. With public schooling, the test comes first and the order and the structure comes before the needs of the child. And as a parent, for me, I need to put my child's needs first. And that means the sacrifice of homeschooling and my much more obviously time and effort on my part in order to provide them an education than it would take to just send them away to school. Discussion question three, which myth kept you from homeschooling sooner? Or if you started from the beginning, I'm sure you still struggled with one of these, which one was the biggest one in your mind? Okay, her next section is the manner of homeschooling. This section kind of talked about finding your own homeschool style and your routine and family culture and those kind of things. Um, so now I feel like we're getting into more of the meat of how this philosophy works a little bit and kind of how to build your homeschool into something that you are going to really enjoy and really find fulfilling. And um, for me, I know when I first started homeschooling, I had no idea that there were different methods of homeschooling out there. I really just kind of thought you made your own little classroom at home and you do things the way that you grew up with. It was kind of a light bulb moment for me when I found out that there were different methods of homeschooling and that I didn't have to just do things the way that they've always been done. And that kind of totally changed the trajectory of our homeschool. In chapter 13, she talks about some of the different um, philosophies and methods of homeschooling. She talked about classical, Montessori, Charlotte Mason, Waldorf, Reggio Amalia and unschooling. And that's kind of what a lot of the people that are part of the wild and free movement <laughs> in homeschooling, so to speak, those are a lot of the main methods that those people choose. Um, but there are more like the traditional method, there's eclectic like we are, other people do like unit studies and those kind of things. So there's more than just what she mentions in here. Um, and I do have a video about some of the six most popular methods of homeschooling if you want some more info about some of those that she didn't mention. So discussion question number four, which method spoke to you the most out of here? Did you already have something established or is this brand new to you? For me, I'm eclectic, obviously. <laughs> I'm kind of a bit of a nonconformist, so I don't really like sticking to any one particular thing. I just have a problem with rules and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I like to choose bits and pieces of different methods and the parts that I like of each one and kind of morph those into our own method, our own approach. But I would definitely say that I kind of follow and have found a lot of freedom in utilizing kind of this wild and free methodology has made a big 
impact in our home school. For our family, I would say that we're a little bit Charlotte Mason, a little bit unschooling, and a little bit kind of unit studies thrown in there, and a little bit traditional, although I really hate workbooks and those kind of things. So not so traditional. But I do like to make sure that we're covering all of the traditional subjects, if that makes sense. <laughs> We just do it using a different methodology, I guess. I do have a day in the life video that I did a few months ago that kind of shows you what a normal day is like in our homeschool, so make sure you check that one out too. In chapter 14, she talked about finding your rhythm and how having a rhythm or a routine is so much better than having a strict schedule and I have found that to be so true in our homeschool and our life um, it's so much more freeing to not be tied to you know such a, a organized day but to have a little bit of flexibility and freedom to let life happen as we go about our homeschool day because we are homeschooling we're not just schooling at home. And so part of that is allowing life to happen and doing things if something comes up. We started time blocking our homeschool day and that has made a big difference to kind of give us a little bit of structure but also allow for some freedom. If you wanna know how time blocking for homeschooling can work, make sure you check out my time blocking video that I did a few months ago. Okay, plugging along here, let's get into the method section. The wild and free philosophy is kind of centered around these five different ideas that she talks about in pretty good depth in this section, and this is where the beauty lies. This is the good stuff. The first one that she talks about is the school of nature and how important it is for us to be ensuring that our kids have a lot of time spent outdoors. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everything we do outside has to be about learning, but it's allowing them to be out in it and exploring and um, just enjoying. I love her quote on page 251. She said that no matter what you do, make time for nature. Schedule it into your week. Don't let it become an afterthought. The thing that you do only after the important work is done. It is the important work. Being in nature, as Louvre wrote, helps children, quote, realize that school isn't supposed to be a polite form of incarceration, but a portal to the wider world. She goes on to say, Dear Mama, don't let society tell you what's important for your children's education. Decide for yourself, and may the peace of the wild things call you back to the very place you belong. <sighs> for me, this is one of the things that drew me to wild and free. Not necessarily because I'm like a super outdoorsy person. I actually struggle with that a little bit. I'm one that, that generally tends to find things that have to be done, like inside chores and those kind of things, and prioritize that over the things that should be done, like time outside, time playing and enjoying each other and those kind of things. So. This for me was something that drew me to Wild and Free because when I joined a Wild and Free group, it kind of gave me that push to get us outside with the kids and exploring nature and going on an adventure once a week and learning about creation around us. And when we made that a part of our school day, it really became a highlight of the week as opposed to it being something that we had to fit in. We prioritized it and made that part of our school and that made all the difference. Next discussion question, how do you make time for nature in your homeschool? And if you don't yet, what is one thing that you can start doing now to make sure that this is a priority for you? The second thing that she talked about was the power of story and all the heart eyes here, guys. This is my jam. I love reading with the kids. I love listening to audiobooks. I love it going to the library and having the kids come home with a new treasure trove of things to dive into. Um, this, I'm all about this one. 
and I did just do a video about our five favorite read-alouds from this last school year, so if you're looking for some fun read-alouds to do with your kids, check those out. As part of this, um, she talked about the power of living books as part of your education, and this is the big thing that I love about the Charlotte Mason philosophy, is using living books to teach history, science, whatever, um, rather than textbooks. Living books really make learning come alive. It's not like reading a bunch of boring facts. It really transports you into the time or place of people experiencing history as it happened. And it makes it so much more enjoyable and um, relatable so that the kids then, and not just kids, but me too, but it sinks in and it makes it come alive and makes it feel real and helps you really to make those connections between why things happened in history and that kind of stuff. So living books, all about it. <laughs> if you want some ideas for some good living books, I will have a link in the description to my Amazon storefront where I have listed in there a bunch of homeschool books that are in large part a lot of those are living books that we have read and really enjoyed in our homeschool. The next chapter she talks about the pedagogy of play and I don't I don't know if I said that right. Pedagogy? Pedagogy? I'm not sure how you pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's about play. In my opinion, it's kind of easy to get stuck in that idea that play is the absence of learning and that when we're playing, we're taking away from time that could be spent learning. But I love how she reinforces the idea and the thought that play is kind of the work of the child. When they're playing, they're learning. And through play, they learn so many valuable things and how we should place an emphasis on giving our children lots of free time. And for me, I've tried to tried to schedule a good amount of free time into our day and allow our kids to really just have that time to do what they want to do. Um, so I know that that's been important, but I think it's something that I could be better at more as far as me playing with them as well. Again, I kind of tend to focus on chores over the fun stuff um, when all of that stuff is kind of staring at me. <laughs> I have a hard time moving on and, and doing something fun with the kids instead. So I want to be better about playing with them, being outside with them, reading with them, doing things with them. So I don't know, how about you? I guess next discussion question, do you schedule time for play in your homeschool day? Drop that on the comment below. On page 275, she talked about all these different studies that had been done abroad where kind of they all kind of came to the same conclusion where she said um, that time for play equates to higher performing, more capable, better adjusted kids. I don't know who wouldn't want that, but I definitely do. So I know I need to make this more of a priority in our homeschool. Okay, the next one that she talked about was the curriculum of curiosity. She really talked about in this chapter the importance of letting kids pursue their own interests and kind of involving them in the educational process and letting them have a say, at least in part, of what they're learning about. And she had a quote that I liked on page 288 where she said, this is the beautiful scandal of homeschooling. We get to learn what fascinates us. I love that. And then she went on with a quote from Clay P. Bedford that I also really like that said, you can teach a student a lesson for a day, but if you can teach him to learn by creating curiosity, he will continue the learning process as long as he lives. And isn't that what we want as homeschoolers? We want to create this atmosphere where learning is a lifestyle, right? Where they choose to learn because they enjoy it. And what they're learning about is something that is gonna go deeper than just a bunch of facts. It's gonna become embedded in who they are and where they're gonna go with their life because it's something that ignites their passion. And so this has been one thing that has been big for us in our homeschool over the last few years. I've really tried to 
allow our kids more freedom in being involved in what they're learning about and giving them more free time to pursue those interests, but also um, straight up asking them what they want to learn about so that I can find a curriculum that will teach them what they're interested in. Because I know <laughs> from our experience that when they're interested in something, that's what's going to stick. That's what they're gonna remember because it's fueled by their interest and their curiosity, which makes a much more lasting impact than just a bunch of random facts on a page every single time. And I have honestly been so amazed at what my kids have learned when they've had that time to pursue the things that they're interested in. My oldest child in particular, he's almost 13, and he for years, he's been obsessed with physics and space and um, lately this year history and politics and so he goes to the library and checks out books about Newton and books about uh, astrophysics and and um, books about biographies of famous American presidents that he just devours them and he comes to me like daily with these facts about things that he's learned because it excites him. And so, yes, we've done some history studies and that kind of thing in our homeschool, of course, but he has learned so much more about history and science by just pursuing those things that he's interested in. So there have certainly been days where I've like thrown the curriculum out the window and said, do your own thing, go learn it. And he is like taking notes through the books he's reading and all this kind of stuff. And it is embedded deep. He's not going to lose that. I know it because that's what he's passionate about. And I have just found tremendous value in this particular part of the philosophy. So the next discussion question, have you asked your kids what they want to learn about? And have you found a way to incorporate that into your homeschool? If so, how? And if not, why not? Has this encouraged you to try it and to step out in that trust of letting our kids be part of their own education? The last one, she talks about the magic of wonder. She talks about how our kids are born naturally with this sense of wonder. When kids are little, you see how they are just amazed at the smallest things. And our job as homeschool parents is to not crush that, to encourage that instead, and to allow them to have that time of childhood where it can last longer, where it's not like forced out of them because it's not cool, but how we can encourage that sense of wonder in our kids by how we go about our homeschool day and incorporating time for them to appreciate um, the world around us and just how things work and just to be amazed. She talked about the benefits of boredom and how that can create this atmosphere where kids then pursue creativity because they have to figure out something to do. And some of the amazing things that come out of that are so fun to see. So don't feel like you have to entertain your kids or that they have to have some sort of constant entertainment. It is tremendously valuable to have time and space for them to be bored so that they can become creative and figure out new things to do. She had a quote from Gladys Hunt in here on page 306 where she was talking about the act of savoring life and slowing down and enjoying what's around us and enjoying our time together. Slowing down and allowing time and space to be in awe of the things that are around us that are worthy of our admiration. And for me, a lot of that links into spirituality and our life of faith as Christians and um, teaching our kids to be in awe of our awesome God and the creation that he made around us. This is one thing where if our children see us captivated by God, that they are naturally then drawn to that too. So it's kind of a lead by example thing where we can, if we look at um, the world with this sense of awe and wonder and amazement, 
then our kids are gonna follow suit and they will see it as that too. I've seen this in our own family when our daughter was like two or three um, and we started doing Wild and Free. We would go to different places and we'd look at the tide pools and be like, wow, look at those little creatures that God made. Or we'd go on a nature walk and look at the different types of leaves on the trees or pine cones or moss or different kind of things and just be like, wow, look how intricate this is. Isn't our God amazing? I'll never forget this one day when we were driving on Stevens Pass across from Western Washington to Eastern Washington. And there's this beautiful mountain range um, and this part of the Cascade Mountain Range that is just breathtaking. And we were driving along and we hear this gasp from the back seat. And then her sweet little high pitched voice go, wow, look what God made. And she's pointing at the mountains. <sighs> That was good. <laughs> it sticks, guys, when we can instill that in them. And we've done our job well. <laughs> okay, guys, those are my like main thoughts, my big thoughts about this book. But I'd love to know if you have something else to add. So another discussion question, I guess. Add in the comments below. What were some of your biggest takeaways from this book? What impacted you the most? And how are you going to use some of these ideas to make changes in your homeschool? I am dying <laughs> to know what those things are for you because I know this has been such a life changer for us. I'm curious to what you thought of this process and how we did this, if this worked, or if there are changes that we should make for our July book. Um, let me know in the comments below about that as well so I have some time to think through some of those things. Our July book is Becoming Mom Strong by Heidi St. John how to fight with all that's in you for your family and your faith. And so this one is more of a parenting book. This was the one that got the second most votes on my poll. And so I'm excited to dive into this one. This is one that I have not read yet, but there is still plenty of time to order your book or audio book and get started on this one before we have our discussion at the end of July for this. And there'll be a link to this book below if you haven't picked up your copy yet. I wanna leave you with one final quote from her book on page 33. She said, there's a quiet voice calling out to us, nudging us to see our children for who they really are, inviting us to give them the freedom they truly desire, the freedom to learn and grow at their own pace, to follow their passions and see where they go, to explore the world without an agenda. We might not have all the answers, doubt will creep in at times, but we know our children and we know the right path for us. I know you've heard it too. You wouldn't be reading this book if you hadn't. It's the call of the outdoors, the call of childhood, the call of more time as a family, the call of wonder and adventure, a stirring inside you to do something different, to be someone different. So here we are, the ones who have answered the call, the call of the wild and free. I love it, love it so much. That's what it's about. I hope you enjoyed this time together, this discussion, this book. I hope that you were encouraged and blessed by reading this and challenged to make some changes to become more wild and free. Thanks for joining me today. Hope you have a great day, bye-bye.